Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. The British arms trade is booming all over the world, especially where there's war or the possibility of it. In both cases, British foreign policy is closely linked to the arms trade. We start the wars, incite them, fuel them, and in every case, the human tide washes up on our shores. Then we cry, Johnny Foreigner! cranking up the xenophobia, which in turn leads to more demand for more wars, more weapons, and off we go again. It's profitable for sure. Arms sales from Britain to the head-chopping Saudi despotism alone has raked in more than 50 billion pounds over the last 30 years at least. Neither are we in any position to control the end result. Weapons and training we sold to the Saudis ended up crushing the democracy movement in Bahrain. Weapons we are now selling the Saudis are quickly transferred to Syria, where they end up in the hands of ISIS and Al-Qaeda. And no doubt some of the bombs, rockets and napalm pouring down on Yemen originated here too. Joining us now is Andrew Smith from the Campaign Against the Arms Trade. A pretty uh, hopeless campaign, isn't it? Britain seems hooked to the arms trade. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on today. Um, I mean, we are trying to campaign ourselves out of existence. We want to end the arms trade. We want Britain to stop selling weapons to murderous dictatorships like Saudi Arabia, murderous dictatorships like Bahrain, and like the entire long list of atrocious despots that the UK is selling weapons to. How's that going? Well, I think it's certainly a marathon, not a sprint. Um, you know yourself, when taking on any vested interest or multi-billion pound industry, that certainly there's an awful lot of influence which the arms trade has in the corridors of power. An example of that was um, earlier this year in January when uh, the ADS, which is kind of the trade body that represents the arms trade, held its annual dinner in um, the Hilton Hotel in Mayfair. It was attended by over 40 MPs from across the Labour Party, the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats. The guest speaker for the night was Vince Cable, who was the government minister who was meant to be in charge of regulating the arms trade. The shadow defence secretary was there as well. If these are the links the arms trade has, then in some ways it's little wonder that they managed to carry such a loud voice. It's a criminal enterprise, isn't it? If I was handing out bread knives to gang members here, I'd be in prison. Uh, but here we have British companies, PAKA, many of them ending up in the House of Lords, having their dinners in Mayfair, getting all the great and the good there. And what they're doing is handing something much more deadly than bread knives mm -hmm. to people who are much more deadly than gang members. Well, it's, that's completely true. I mean, the government takes a very sensible position that it shouldn't be easy for any of us to go into a shop and buy a gun. It's actually incredibly difficult and quite right too because the government's made the correct calculation that if it's really easy to get weapons and there's more likely to be crime. On the other hand, it has no problem selling vast quantities of weapons. And actually, every year, UKTI um, publishes its list of priority markets for arms sales. And the most recent list includes Bahrain, it includes Saudi Arabia, it includes a whole host of really oppressive di uh, dictatorships and regimes. Saudi Arabia is the largest buyer of UK weapons. Well, it's worse, yeah. isn't it? Because we're selling weapons to Saudi Arabia that within weeks are in the hands of the Al-Qaeda and ISIS forces uh, in Syria. But I, I want to take you back to something that quite illuminating that you alluded to a minute ago. This is a bipartisan affair. Mm. Labour MPs were at that dinner. The shadow defence minister was at that dinner. When Labour was in power, I well remember a conversation with Jack Straw over the, uh, the issue of uh, selling weapons to the Suharto dictatorship in Indonesia. Mm. This after Labour had promised that they wouldn't do so, and promised that they would have an ethical foreign policy. What is it about this junk that they're addicted to that uh, spreads so easily across the front benches? I think you're correct. It's definitely not a party political issue. Um, as I say, all the parties were represented at that dinner. I imagine your invite must have got lost in the mail. <laughs> um, but the, all the main parties were represented at that dinner. Um, and it was front bench spokespeople for all the parties that were giving lots of warm words to the arms trade and accepting very expensive dinners from arms company executives. Now, if that isn't going to... Well, Mr Blair had uh, a, a very close relationship with Dick Evans of mm. British Aerospace, the biggest of the arms companies. And indeed, they're uh, still working happily together in 
uh, some parts of the former Soviet Union, and uh, both doing very well. Thank you. Uh, so the, 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 this relationship must be based on uh, something tangible. And what's the tangible? Is it money? Well, with BAE Systems specifically, um, in Robin Cook's autobiography, he, specific, he says that BAE Systems, in his words, had the backdoor key to Downing Street. And I don't think he's talking literally, but what he was meaning was that Tony Blair would not make a foreign policy decision without BAE being on board first. And I think with BAE, there is a very, very close relationship. But part of that is because of revolving door, which we've seen from the corridors of power into the corridors of the arms companies. Probably the most naked example of that was Jeff Hoon, who was the Defence Secretary in the last Labour government, who gave a contract worth £1.7 billion to Augusta Westland. And then, funnily enough, after he left Parliament in disgrace, might I add, after a lobbying scandal, turned up as head of European sales for Augusta Westland. So I think there's certainly all these kind of connections. And I think transparency is the most important thing. And if there's one trade that doesn't like being transparent and doesn't like having the results of its terrible crimes held up to public, then it's the arms trade. Um, I wonder why uh, Britain has such a primary role in this industry. H has it always been the case, or is it more so post-Thatcher era that it has got nothing else to sell? Well, it certainly grew during the Thatcher years, and certainly that's been the kind of policy ever since then. Um, but actually, uh, we always hear facetious arguments about it creating lots of jobs, but in reality this isn't the case. Arms exports account for about 0.2% of jobs in the UK economy. It's actually a very small sector, but it's a very small sector which has always enjoyed a totally disproportionate level of support. I mean, um, we've got the Dicey Arms Fair coming up in September in East London, which is going to be kind of like Glastonbury for the arms trade. It's going to bring together thousands of arms company representatives with lots of politicians, with almost every despotic dictatorship you could care to mention. And it's being organised by the government. It's being organised by civil servants. It's going to have government ministers in attendance. They'll be doing a lot of promotion for it. And that's a key point, because the government isn't a neutral bystander in the arms trade that um, takes a deal from company A and sells it to country B or whatever. It's actually an active participant as well. We've seen that even in the last few months. Philip Hammond, the Foreign Secretary, has been in Bahrain openly lobbying for the Bahraini government to buy Eurofighter jets. And he's been openly talking about negotiations in the press. There's no attempt at secrecy, because there doesn't need to the government is a pro-arms trade government and wants to send that message out. Well, it's, it's Glastonbury in which the participants are up to their knees in blood rather than mud. Yes. Uh, but it is a mark of shame on London that yet again we're going to host uh, this grisly bazaar where the worst generalissimos are ferried around in Ministry of Defence cars, I've seen them, mm. protected by British military officers in no doubt bullet and bomb proof limousines ferried out from their five star London hotels in the centre of town out to the East End uh, where they will be courted openly. Mm. Uh, no doubt there will be dodgy business done as there has been done in the past. And off go these generalissimos with more methods, means of killing people. Now. That's a very direct example of the state uh, organizing this mm. criminal enterprise. But, of course, the taxpayer is forced in many cases, aren't they, to underwrite this through the Export Credit Guarantee Scheme. Tell us about that. Well, yeah. I mean, there's often this kind of misconception that the arms trade brings in lots of money. And we've already talked about jobs, but actually on the money front, it doesn't either. There's been some studies have put it as a public, that as a subsidised industry, arms exports alone cost taxpayers about £700 million every year. So Because of this? It's, it's partially because of, because of that, partially because of the money which gets spent on organising all the various arms trips and tours and part of it on kind of promotion of events like Dicey and things like that. So actually, it's not this kind of economic powerhouse of a country. And even if it was, even if those mm. kind of talks were true, even if there's any truth in it whatsoever, then, so then that raises the question of why the UK would be so dependent on having to sell weapons to some of the worst people in the world in order to pay its way. And actually, there's a very real human cost to this as well, because if we look to 
Egypt, where UK tear gas has been used against peaceful protesters. We look to Hong Kong, where UK tear gas again has been used. We look to Bahrain, where UK armoured vehicles were involved in putting down the democracy protests. In all of these cases, when the truth comes to light, it's only because of the good work of journalists and activists on the ground. It's not because the UK government holds up its hands willingly and um, admits that it's done all of these terrible things. No, it says that uh, it seeks assurances uh, that uh, the weapons we're selling will not be used for external aggression or internal repression, which begs the question, what are they there for? <laughs> What's the weapons for if they're not going to be used in either of these two things? One interesting example of this is Israel as well, because in 2009, the then Foreign Secretary David Miliband gave a speech in the House of Commons where he said it was almost certain UK arms had been used in the bombardment of Gaza um, in 2008-2009. And of course, at the time, he said, we will try and reflect on this in all future arms sales. And of course, nothing changed. And then actually, last Never summer... Never trust a milli band. <laughs> then last summer, um, UK arms again were almost certainly used against the people of Gaza. We know this because the Department of Business, Innovation and Skills did its own report, which found that there were 12 licenses for weapons which were, in their words, likely to have been used against people in Gaza. And I don't think that we're going to suddenly see the UK stopping exports to Israel, even though it's shown time and time again it will use UK exports against mm. the people of Gaza and to And breaking the crime. rules that the British government says that it uh, imposes. But hey, some things never change. But I must say your campaign is magnificent. How do people Thank support you. the campaign against the arms trade? Well, if you go onto our website, there's an awful lot of different activities and events which are coming up all across the country. We've got really strong local active groups, but we are going to be mobilising and, and, and campaigning for the against the Dicey Arms Fair when it rolls into town this September as well. Um, there's also a lot of other things on the website. You can actually see a list of every single UK arms export that has been approved since 2008. So you can see the... Co the see exactly what the weapons we've been selling to these terrible regimes are. Andrew, we need you in Parliament. Good young <laughs> Scotsman, that. Coming up after the break, if the arms trade is bad for your health, wait until you hear about the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, TTIP. If you stay tuned, you shortly will. <laughs> Welcome back to Sputnik. The TTIP negotiations between the EU and the US have been almost wholly conducted in secret. And that's the shape of things to come if the agreement is reached. Yet its consequences for you are far more profound than the recent general election, for example, where at least everything was out on the table. TTIP would vastly extend the scale of privatization into health, education, water services and many other areas. It would give special corporate courts the power to override national parliaments and take us further down the road to an Orwellian future where what is called freedom is in fact a new world order of corporate slavery. Joining us to discuss it is agitator-in-chief in the campaign against TTIP, Samuel Lowe. Samuel, a fine title. Who are you agitating on behalf of? How broad is the opposition to this agreement and how close are we to its conclusion. There's about 300 plus organizations across Europe campaigning against this right now. We've just reached two, just breached to the two million barrier in signatures from across Europe opposing it. Um, and it's, is, is it close to coming to a conclusion? That's a very big question. We don't know. The, it's, they're just coming up to the 10th round of the negotiations. It's been going on for a couple of years already. And I would say that every six months that goes by without it being concluded probably puts on another year to the time frame. So far we've been holding it up um, quite Are there any European governments openly opposed to it? There's no European governments openly opposed to the whole deal. There are European governments who have concerns about specific aspects. For example, Austria, who um, you mentioned in your introduction, the corporate courts aspect, which maybe we'll elaborate on in a little bit, but they, they are specifically opposed to that. Is unanimity in the EU required for this treaty? Um, oh yes, it is, in terms of um, the Council, so they would all have to vote it through. Whilst there are governments against it, the aim of the campaign is really to try and derail it before it gets to that stage. So the uh, European Union uh, is one side, the mm -hmm. United States is the other. Is it overwhelmingly popular there? No. So uh, we, as Friends of the Earth, we also have a group 
um, in the USA and there at the moment there's a huge campaign there against Fast Track Authority which is another it's called FTA there's lots of acronyms in the trade world and what they're campaigning against is giving the president the sole authority to sign off trade agreements without it going through Congress and the reason they're so worried about this is because of TTIP but also its sister agreement the Trans-Pacific Partnership with the US which the US is negotiating with of many countries including Chile uh, Vietnam and um, Japan and there's a lot of concerns on the US side as well so it's very much not one of those things of us in Europe just being anti-US there's consensus among civil society on both sides of the Atlantic that these deals aren't good for people and should be stopped well summarize for us just exactly uh, how bad it would be for us at its worst it would be very bad so I'd say when we look at things at Friends of the Earth we say our, our approach when it comes to the economy is we want the economy to work for people for the environment and for the planet and we look at TTIP and we think that would work against it uh, if I can give some examples maybe of the different things that we could we could expect uh, we could see businesses and the US having a lot more influence on our laws. We've already seen some of this happen during the course of the trade agreement uh, negotiations. So we've seen um, environmental law changed, energy law changed so that we can import, so that more tar sands will be imported from the US and Canada to the European Union. And that was um, under pressure whilst these negotiations were going on. We've seen uh, chemicals, that are uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals, they're uh, used in pesticides. We've seen the European Commission's decision to ban those being cancelled because of pressure from the US whilst these trade agreements going on. And then also when you get to the ISDS mechanism, the investor state dispute mechanism, which is these corporate courts, mm. which sees legal sovereignty being given away, I suppose, from the national judiciary and decisions are taken in arbitration panels with usually three lawyers um, for vast amount of money. To so give an example of this, uh, Philip Morris is currently suing the Australian government for uh, bringing in plain package cigarettes. Uh, a fracking company in Canada is currently suing uh, the Canadian government for bringing in a moratorium on fracking for $250 million. These are under other trade agreements. So that one I just mentioned is under mm. NAFTA. Mm. Um, at the moment, these this mechanism does exist in some agreements that the EU has got actually quite a lot about 3,000 but there's none with the US so it'd be bringing in a whole different dimension and they have a different attitude to many things there yes uh, GM food for example is very much bigger mm -hmm. there than here almost nowhere in Europe is it uh, being openly promoted and sold whereas in the US it's becoming hegemonic uh, the attitude to safety standards, mm -hmm. chemicals, pesticides, and so on, uh, would all be profoundly and negatively affected if U.S. standards Absolutely. became uh, implementable here and by courts, irrespective of what Parliament thought. Yeah, exactly. From your examples, it shows that the multinationals are basically dictating our, our countries then. I, I suppose it, it is very interesting. So. When you bring these concerns, the, so that you've just mentioned, to the European Commission who are in charge of negotiating this, they say, oh, don't worry, you know, th these aren't on the table, these issues. But you can actually see from the US in the media, their publicity, what their aggressive interests are. What do they want to get out of this? And it's exactly the things you've mentioned. And in any trade agreement, it's a negotiation. There's got to be compromise. And we just don't trust the European Commission not to compromise because the European Commission is also, we're not a sort of uh, benevolent benevolent partner in this. We want things from the US. We'd like access to their public procurement markets for European companies where they have something called Buy American there, which is to try and source local food for schools. We don't like that. So we'd, it's hard for me to believe that we wouldn't trade off one some, thing, one for thing to the other. Yeah, absolutely. There's already concern in this country. It's why we've got a referendum coming up on the European Union about sovereignty being sucked from the national parliament to the European level, much less responsive, at least in theory, to public opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, if the European Union then hands on much of that sovereignty to corporate courts, for example, yeah. Yeah. Uh, then where does that leave the ordinary citizen in European countries? Leaves them uh, up a gum tree. Tell me how the privatization issues arise from this. 
So the privatisation issues, I think the first initial concern was that the, pro that the NHS would be part of the deal, that we would be trying to sell off bits of it to the US. Um, we interestingly met with Ken Clark um, last year and he said, why are you worried about this? We're doing it anyway. But the, so, so, the, the, so the debate is actually a bit more nuanced than that. So whenever, you bring, whenever this issue comes up with the European Commission, they say, no, it's not on the table, look, we've said this or this or this. But actually it's the corporate courts bit that the people are concerned about. The, the worry is that services that have been privatised will become, prohibit it'll become prohibitively expensive to re-nationalise them in the future because these courts, which happen outside of the national judiciary, can, you can get sued for a vast amount of money. The highest award ever was $50 billion. You know, so, so, so actual people's concerns are, are less based in the idea that it will mean that the governments have to privatise, although if they wanted to, this agreement would facilitate them doing it. It's to do with the fact that you would not then be able to reverse it. The uh, British courts, of course, uh, reach decisions which are appealable, uh, mm -hmm. sometimes appealable on several levels and right up to the European level. Mm -hmm. These corporate courts, will they have a right of appeal and if so to whom? As it stands, they do not have an appeal mechanism. This is, this is one of the big discussions going on in Europe at the moment, of they're trying to rebrand these corporate courts to make them palatable, and one of the ideas is that there might be an appeal mechanism, although that, this is all entirely on the to European... To another three lawyers. This, right, so this is entirely on the European side. We don't know what the US will agree to or not, so mm -hmm. they might not agree to this. I think something that's quite interesting is the UK government, um, back in 2013, I think April, commissioned a study um, from the LSE. The study was to look into what would be the benefit of having these corporate courts, this ISDS mechanism, to the UK in an agreement with the US. And the conclusions were quite interesting. It was that there would be no political gain, no economic gain, some economic risk, some political risk. So, and then this study was rarely heard from ever again. I mean, it's on their website if you know where to look for it. Mm. So, so our government's very aware that this ISDS mechanism, these corporate courts, don't do what they will achieve, which is the idea is it will bring in more investment. There's no evidence of this. No. So if this TTIP reaches agreement, how will this affect the rest of the world? So one of the drivers, I suppose, behind the TTIP agreement is that the WTO has, so has stalled, effectively developing com countries have said, we're not getting a good deal out of this. Mm. We, want, we want it to be a bit fairer. <laughs> and that's obviously stalled all neg trade negotiations at the WTO yeah. level. So these, this big bilateral agreement is, is promoted by them as such. It's the idea they want to set a global standard for trade for the rest of the world for the rest of the world. So there's a, ch there's a chance that other tr countries would then be able to join it. But, you know, it, it, there'll be some elements of trade diversion where stuff that was imported from the rest of the world before will now be imported from the US. But I suppose it's more, of a, a, it's more for me, an idea of if you are doing something like this for the rest of the world, because the idea of having trade with the US isn't in and of itself offensive. No, you know, not. of course not. There's lots of things we'd like. So say they went into the trade agreement saying these are the highest standards we can get that work and we want to bring both of our standards to that level and we've both got, as governments, the public's trust that this is sincerely what we're trying to achieve. There would be no issue. But we're we, we, well, there's a worry that, especially if there's ISDS in this agreement, this is setting a global standard that the rest of the world is trying to remove themselves from. Indonesia have, are trying to get out of all trade agreements with this ISDS mechanism in South Africa as well, because they've seen it to be harmful. And if it's in TTIP, I mean, it's the global standard for the next 20 years. God save us. The best of luck uh, with your campaign. How do people uh, sign up for it? Uh, there's many groups working on it. So Friends of the Earth, War on Want, uh, World Development Movement, now called Global Justice Now, 38 Degrees, The Union. So on all of our websites, you can find it. If you specifically want to go through the Friends of the Earth website, www.foe.co.uk forward slash TTIP. Excellent. Thanks, Sam, for that. And now it's your turn to tell us what you think through the portals of social media. What's rattling, Gayatri? About this British arms trade, Joe Cook says, cheerleaders in chief for the British arms trades are Prince Charles and Andrew. Their business trips to Saudi soaked in blood. Well, and David Cameron too, of course. I mean, there was one occasion in the last parliament where David Cameron from the dispatch box denounced me as a friend of dictators before getting that. onto an airplane that very afternoon and flying to Saudi Arabia and Bahrain openly to sell them weapons. About the TTIP uh, question, uh, Free Press says, 
TTIP is backed by three main UK parties. It begs the question who they really represent, not the public, surely. And that's all that we've got for this week. Which, alas, means that's the end of the show. You can stay in touch with us on Twitter at RT underscore Sputnik or on Facebook at Sputnik on Russia Today. It's goodbye from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous.